Welcome everyone to the Zora Neale Hurston Class of 1928 Centennial Reading and Conversation. My name is PJ Douglas Sands and I'm a member of the Barnard Class of 1998. <laughs> On behalf of the AABC Reunion Committee, welcome and thank you for joining us for this special program. I spent many days and nights toiling, studying, laughing, and crying in the Zora Neale Hurston Lounge in Brooks Hall during my time here at Barnard. Zora's legacy of being the first of many, and of which I followed humbly. In fact, I read so much of her work here while at Barnard as I majored in Pan-African Studies and Political Science. Therefore, my active participation in today's centennial reading brings me pure joy, perhaps another PJ I can be known for. Now I have the honor of introducing our speakers for today's program, Jennifer Rosales and Monica Miller. As a member of the President's senior staff, Jennifer Rosales provides strategic vision and leadership in cultivating an inclusive campus by advancing a holistic approach to institutional learning. Through the Office for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, she proactively develops and implements policies and programs that educate and promote diversity, equity, and inclusion as core values of the college. Jennifer, how are you doing? Printing things out and putting it in here oversees the Center for Engaged Pedagogy, CEP, which develops new teaching and learning initiatives, diverse learning contexts, and opportunities for interdisciplinary collaboration. She also supervises the Office for Community Engagement and Inclusion, CEI, guiding and expanding the college's commitment to working with its neighbors and the city. Previously, she was the inaugural executive director of the CEP. She is co-authoring a book, Media Literacy of the Oppressed, designing at the margins, Rutledge for forthcoming, and a co-PI on an NSF grant on computing education at Barnard. Formerly, she was the Director of Research and Evaluation at the Center for Social Justice, Georgetown University. Jennifer received her PhD and MA in Media Studies and her BA in History from the University of Southern California. Our next presenter is Ms. Monica L. Miller. She's the Anne Whitney Olin Professor of Africana Studies and English at Barnard College, Columbia University a specialist in contemporary African-American and African diasporic literature and cultural studies. She is the author of the award-winning book, Slaves to Fashion, Black Dandyism and the Styling of Black Diasporic Identity. A grantee from the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture, and the Institute for Citizens and Scholars. Monica is a frequent commentator in the media and arts world and teaches and writes about black literature, art and program performance, fashion cultures, and contemporary black European culture and politics. While at Barnard, she, had ed she edited or co-edited two volumes of the Scholar and Feminist Online on Zora Neale Hurston's life, work, and legacy, and frequently teaches and comments on Hurston and the coterie of writers, artists, and intellectuals around her during the Harlem Renaissance presenting Jennifer Rosales and Monica Miller. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, excited to see you all here. Uh, I'm going to introduce uh, our committee and our charge, some of the work we've been doing this year with some of the folks in this room, and then I'm going to pass it to Professor Miller. So on January of 1925, celebrated novelist, folklorist, and anthropologist Zora Neale Hurston enrolled in Barnard College, becoming Barnard's first black student. Already an award-winning writer, she had great success in Harlem. However, in Morningside Heights, she struggled to fit in on Barnard's elite, overwhelmingly white campus. Her steadfastness and resilience enabled her to graduate from Barnard and become the first trained black anthropologist. Her life's work combined her training and interest in literature, history, theater, and performance, as well as 
folklore and anthropology. It changed the disciplines of anthropology and American and African American literature. Her legacy can be seen in the work of black Barnard writers and other luminaries who similarly work across disciplines to tell the stories of black people with their cultures. Professor Monica Miller, our acclaimed resident Hurstonian, as I like to call her, um, at Barnard, will share more about Zora Neale Hurston's work and life. But before she does, I'd like to provide some context on the work we have co-led with many members of the Barnard community to students to honor her and the 100-year matriculation and graduation centennial in 2025 and the 100 years of black students who came after her. This extended momentous anniversary provides Barnard the opportunity to celebrate, ex examine, um, and interrogate black students' experiences at Barnard and to recommit to our national leadership as a college that is diverse, inclusive, and equitable. I'm not sure. Get back on. Do I open this? Does that help? Yeah, yeah. Oh, we got it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Um, that uh, framed photograph is also in Good Barnard stuff. Hall right now, if you would like to go see it, third floor? Second floor, second floor. Um, we have that here, it's beautiful. Um, so here's a little information about our committee um, and the work we were doing. Do you mind, uh, next slide please. So this is the list of people that have been part of this committee. And so you'll see folks on here that are trustees, alums, uh, a lot of faculty, some you may have had, um, and current students as well. And so this group has been working together over the past year to come up with a proposal for how to celebrate um, uh, Zora Neale Hurston, the 100 years of black students. And so I wanted to share some of the ideas that we have come up with and the proposal we're putting forward to think about kind of building a runway on how we want to celebrate. Next slide, please. So these are kind of the areas that we structured what we're hoping to be able to achieve. So it's reading Hurston, teaching Hurston, Hurston Harlem and beyond, gatherings and structural support. So I just wanted to give you some examples of some of the creative things that have come out of this committee that we hope to be able to do in the coming years. So when reading Hurston, we are thinking specifically about what are the classes that we can develop as a committee and, and a team here on this campus. And so Professor Miller is going to partner with Vanessa Agar-Jones across the street, an anthropologist, uh, to put together a course that combines both Hurston's literary work and her anthropology work. The idea behind this class would be to be able to go to Eatonville, Florida, um, and take part in the Zora Festival of the Arts. We have another professor in theater who is putting together a drama and performance class on Hurston's work. We have other, uh, we have Professor Miller is going to do another class on the Black Barnard writers that extends beyond Hurston to other writers at this college uh, that have graduated like uh, Nazaki uh, Shange and June Jordan. Um, and then we have a professor who is going to take the work done by Professor Quandra Prettyman um, and redevelop that class moving forward to celebrate her work as well. Mm. We'd also like to think about it for the college. So thinking about how we, we do this thing, I'm not sure how many of you participated in Barnard Reads when you were a student, but everybody over the summer will read a book and work together with a faculty member before you get started. We were thinking, what if it's a Hurston book and what if it's everybody, not just students, but maybe we get alums reading it, maybe we get faculty, staff, and it's a whole community 
um, event. We've also been thinking about teaching Hurston. So how do we take the expertise of certain faculty member, not just in um, the content that comes out of her work, but also the methods that she uses. So thinking about some of those methods and sharing those with other faculty so that they might get um, integrated into their courses. So what kind of work would we have to do to bring a cohort of faculty together to do that? Uh, we'd love to be able to put together exhibits and gatherings of the student work um, that has happened uh, that has um, in the last couple of years and will continue through these courses. Uh, we have uh, an alum who's part of the group right now who's putting together a documentary on uh, with interviews on what was the experience of being black at Barnard like. Um, and so she's in the process of interviewing. We will collect those interviews in the archive and then be able to showcase them. Uh, other things that we would like to do is to think about, are there endowed chairs, um, interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary, English, anthropology, that, um, that we could come up with that could continue her legacy of literary and performance criticism, narrative analysis, digital methods, oral history, uh, writing. Um, and then we'd love to take the, the lounge, the Zora Neale Hurston lounge that is currently um, uh, the, the space for BOSS and help provide uh, more funds for programming and support so that they can continue to use that space um, in a way that feels very supportive. Um, so I'll just kind of end before passing it to Professor Miller and letting her really um, uh, share more of, of Hurston's work um, with you all and thinking about kind of what we'd love to be able to do um, is, is, is still in brainstorm process. So we are gonna save the last 10 minutes to hear from you all on ideas you might have on how we'll be able to celebrate these um, 100 years um, uh, at the end of this event. So without further ado, I will pass it to Professor Miller. <laughs> That's good. You can't read it, but I'm going to read it for you. <laughs> good afternoon, everyone. It's nice to see everyone here. And I am excited to, um, to share a little bit of Hurston uh, lore with you. Some of you may be familiar with, um, with Hurston's life and legacy, but I always think it's really important before reading or teaching her work to know a little bit more about what it was like to be a black woman writer right, in the 1920s when Hurston um, was here um, in New York. And in particular, how did Hurston navigate being a Barnard student and a Harlem Renaissance writer. Um, and this will give us a context for thinking about the two pieces that, um, that I chose for you to read today. Her essay, How, Does it, How, it, Feels to be, um, How it Feels to be Colored Me, and a short story that was recently discovered called The Back Room. Okay. So I think I'll start here. So one of the things that, um, that I always think about when I'm teaching um, Hurston or talking about Hurston to various kinds of audiences is the ways in which she was both ordinary, right, and I think extraordinary. And in particular, the fact that she was a real person, right? For those of us that, that do a lot of Hurston research, that becomes really obvious when we read her letters and when we read other people's accounts of her. So I wanted to start off with this letter, which you can't see, but I'm gonna read it. Um, um, which is the first known letter um, that Hurston, the first letter that we can find, right, that uh, Hurston, um, that Hurston sent. And it is to the president or dean of Morgan College, um, uh, Morgan Academy, where, um, where she did the first part of her um, sort of late high school and early college um, education. Uh, she is a freshman. So she sends this letter, I'll read it. Um, it says, dear dean, I want to know you and Mrs. Pickens ever so much for many reasons. The first of which is you are interesting to others. Second, you are interesting to me. Third, I want to reverse the usual process and know the writing by the writer. Hmm. Greatest of all, 30 or 40 years hence, the world, will look for, the world will look for someone who has really known you to write your biography. <laughs> to see you as a husband and a father and have you as a friend and a teacher. 
Should so, that mean one should get, that should mean that one should get beyond the obvious, the beyond the superficial. I want to do that. I would like to know to what extent a woman of Mrs. Pickens' character and accomplishments would influence your life. Impertinent, isn't it? But I want to get all that Morgan has to give. I feel that I will have done something equal, equal to the course at Morgan if I really have known you and Mrs. Pickens. Yours respectfully, Zora Neale Hurston. Okay, the next slide. So, Called a genius of the South, as Jennifer mentioned, novelist, folklorist, and anthropologist, what we learn from this letter, right, is that Hurston is bold and canny, and in some ways what I like to describe as a kind of creator of chaos, right? Um, as I said before, she's both ordinary and extraordinary, a real person with real talents and curiosities. And as I want to say a little bit about, I mean, what I'm kind of falsely <laughs> characterizing as the ordinary, I mean, a little bit about her early life. Okay. So her background before she came, came to Barnard, um, Harlem, and participated in the Harlem Renaissance. She grew up in, um, and this is a picture of her um, in her sort of late, like early, late teens, early 20s. Um, she grew up in Eatonville, Florida, which Jennifer mentioned, which was a truly unique experience. It was the first incorporated all-black town or an intentional black community. So Eatonville is depicted in part, and you can see a little bit of it at the beginning of the essay, How It Feels to be Colored Me. It's, it's depicted in part in almost all of Hurston's writing. Jennifer. Um, Hurston's father was one of the early founders and mayors of Eatonville, a big voice that we hear um, a lot in her novel, um, Their Eyes Are Watching God. He was also a Baptist preacher, and her mother was a teacher who died when Hurston was very young. Her mother was the one who encouraged her, um, and this is a very famous Hurston phrase, to jump at the sun, to be a truly ambitious person. And this was really unusual advice for working class or even middle class black girl at the time. But after her mother died when she was 13, everything changed. And this is the way that she describes it in um, the essay, How It Feels to be Colored. She said, I remember that very day that I became colored. Up to my 13th year, I lived in the little Negro town of Eatonville, Florida. It is an exclusively colored town. The only white people I knew passed through the town coming to or coming, going to or coming from Orlando. But changes came into the family when I was 13. Sorry for the typo. I was sent to school in Jacksonville. I left Eatonville, the town of the Oleanders, Azora. When I disembarked from the riverboat at Jacksonville, she was no more. It seemed that I had suffered a sea change. I was not Zora of Orange County anymore. I was now a little colored girl. I found it out in certain ways. In my heart, as well as in the mirror, I became a fast brown, warranted not to rub or run. So when she leaves Eatonville, she enters into a world that is really demarcated very starkly along racist, along racial and racist lines, and this erases her individuality. The 10 years that she spent after leaving Jacksonville and before she enrolled in Morgan Academy, she struggled to support herself, um, never mind jump at the sun. She suffered during that time what she calls in another letter to someone else, tremendous losses and terrific shocks. Mm. These losses were so significant um, so much so that she lied about her birthday thereafter, erased those 10 years from her life. When she entered Barnard, she was 34, pretending to be 26. Her pursuit of an education and her work as a writer and anthropologist enabled her to develop tools to survive in this world and to sort of survive her own, in some ways, life. Hurston was really determined to go after those things that she lost in the move from Eatonville to Jacksonville, um, which were education and independence. And she made her way up from Florida to Baltimore, enrolled in Morgan Academy, and then Howard University. This is her, you can, she's kind of small in there. Um, Howard University. During all of this time, she was self-supporting and sort of barely making it. She worked during her time at Howard as a manicurist and an assistant to a vaudeville actress. Um, she also worked in a black barbershop. She was the only woman in that barbershop, and that was a sort of space that was very um, similar um, for her um, to Eatonville, right? And that it was, it was filled with storytelling and functioned very much as a sort of porch, right? For, um, for and within the black community. She began to write at Howard, and this is from the, lit this picture of her is in the literary magazine at Howard, um, and was encouraged to come to New York 
um, at the time, which was becoming the sort of Negro Mecca by, Jennifer, next slide, by Elaine Locke, who is the man on your left, um, uh, who was a professor of philosophy at Howard and one of the architects of the Harlem Renaissance, along with W.E.B. Du Bois, who's here on the right, um, who was leading the NAACP, and particularly their literary wing here um, uh, in New York in the early 1920s. Hurston entered, as Jennifer said, a literary contest in 1925 and won four prizes. She famously came up to New York to collect these prizes and entered the after party by flinging a red feather boa around her neck and calling out the name of the play that won her the highest of the four prizes that she won, which was Color Struck. So she came in and she said, Color Struck! <laughs> this was really a double entendre, right? To strike the colors is actually a military term, um, which, um, which means to sort of plant a flag in the ground either at the beginning or the end, or the beginning or the outcome of a battle, right? So in that way, that's a lovely metaphor. Color struck also means within, within African American sort of vernacular, right, is um, refers to the preference, right, for lighter skin um, individuals and a proximity to whiteness. Mm -hmm. So she was very much entering this party, right, with an announcement and an announcement that she was ready and willing, right, and certainly able as a prize winner, right, to address um, issues of race, of class, of gender, right, um, intra-racially, right, as well as for um, uh, what that time would have been a kind of mixed um, audience. So the extraordinary, right? She was part of a particular vanguard in the Harlem Renaissance, the younger Negro artists, right? At the same time, she was a student at Barnard, and this was a very delicate balancing act. At Barnard, she was, if we all, as we all know, Barnard's first black student, um, admitted by Barnard trustee Annie Nathan Meyer, who was at that awards show and was actually dazzled by Hurston on that night. She was on campus here, she was older than all of the other students by a fair <laughs> amount, right? Um, which gave her some advantage. She had life experience, right? Um, but she was also working class, she was black, and she was southern, and these were decided disadvantages. Barnard was not a particularly welcome place, welcoming place. She was given a partial scholarship. She had to raise money um, in order to come here. She was not allowed to live in the dorms, right? The dorms were segregated. Um, she had an apartment first um, in Harlem and then she lived um, uh, downtown. Um, she needed all kinds of unfamiliar supplies, needed to maintain a kind of social and academic life. Um, she talks about these often in her letters, um, specific shoes, stockings, gloves, outfits for tennis and golf, right? Wow. She came to New York, self-described as with $1.50, no job, no friends, and a lot of hope and that she was going to try to wrestle up a future or die trying. Poverty was always an issue for her, and she writes often to Annie Nathan Meyer um, saying that she has just, say, 11 cents or a few dollars to her name and is wondering where, in some ways, her next, um, where the money's gonna come from. As the only black student, Hurston experienced many other micro and macro aggressions. Students made fun of her accent in French class because she had such a heavy Southern accent. Um, she was told that she could come to, the, come to the prom at the Ritz, but only if, and this goes back to color struck, if she could bring a man as light-skinned as herself. Um, this situation eased, right, when she became friends with one of the most famous white, uh, white women, yes, white women writers at the time, Fanny Hurst. She became friends with Fanny Hurst and also started working for, for Hurst as her secretary, but really they, Hurst, un, Fanny Hurst understood and recognized Hurston's um, talent as a writer. So really, Hurston became the person that Hurst was bouncing her writing, of, like was, was the kind of writing partner um, for her um, at the time. Even though, even with this popularity, she still very, felt very much, um, very alienated um, at Barnard. Um, uh, being in such an elite environment, um, full of privilege was not really easy for her. And she describes this in um, How It Feels to Be Colored Me. Can you? Jennifer, can you have that next slide? Okay, I'm gonna, I don't wanna turn around. She says, I do not always feel colored. Even now, I often achieve the unconscious Zora of Eatonville before the Hegira. I feel most colored when I am thrown against a, against a sharp white background, for instance, at Barnard. Beside the waters of the Hudson, I feel my race. Amongst the thousand white persons, I am a dark rock surged upon and overswept by a creamy sea. 
I am surged upon and overswept, but through it all, I remain myself. When covered by the waters, I am, and the ebb but reveals me again. So we can talk about that um, imagery a little bit later. Powerful. At the same time, right, as this is happening, she is a well-known writer in Harlem and part of an artistic renaissance. This group of the younger Negro artists was really tired or getting tired of the, following the advice and dictates of the older writers and race men like Du Bois and Locke, and were really insisting that black writers show black people to, who will, they were really insisting that black writers show black people to the world in their best possible light. Um, for example, Du Bois, this is silly. Du Bois was against jazz, he hated jazz. It was the jazz age, right? <laughs> so, um, so she and Langston Hughes formed a group that put out a single issue of an extremely provocative magazine called Fire. This magazine was controversial because it was an example of a new set of demands about African-American literature and culture. It included the first queer story right, in the African-American literary tradition and also that we know about, and then also um, a story about prostitution, which was a very, or sexual freedom. You can read that story in a number of ways, um, which is also very, very controversial. So if the early Renaissance is really concerned about respectability politics, right, and explaining black people to white people, the later Renaissance was very much a more of an intra-racial conversation that championed black self-expression. So the next slide. And an example of this is um, an essay that Langston Hughes wrote um, in 1926 expressing this explicitly. He says, we younger Negro artists who create now intend to express our individual dark sins selves without fear or shame. If white people are pleased, we are glad. If they are not, it doesn't matter. We know we are beautiful and ugly too. If colored people are pleased, we are glad. If they are not, their displeasure doesn't matter either. We build our temples for tomorrow, strong as we know how, and we stand on top of the mountain, free within ourselves. Mm -hmm. Kirsten's contribution to this movement, we thought, was to write about and describe the lives and artful living of what she called the, Negros, the Negro lowest down, um, Southern working class um, black women and men who are part of a vibrant, dynamic, and rich oral culture captured in the black vernacular and also in black folklore. But we now also know that she also wrote about the black intelligentsia along the lines of many of her contemporaries during the Harlem Renaissance, but with a characteristic attention to gender, class, and the struggle to get ahead, which is illustrated in the story that we also gave to you in the back room. Um, since, since 2020, we now have a collected edition of Hurston's stories from the 1920s, um, and they are fast. I really recommend this book to you. Um, uh, it's called Hitting a Straight Lick with a Crooked Stick. Um, mm -hmm. They're fascinating experiments, um, Hurston's uh, literary experiments, um, in examining modern black life. There, there are stories in there about migration, south to north, about relationships, a lot of relationships, um, both um, going well and going bad. Um, there's also really interesting experiments in, in, um, in, uh, in recording sort of black language. There's a story in there that like, takes place in the form of um, really profane uh, Bible verses. <laughs> or in the form of Bible verses. How much time do I have? What do you think? Oh, I'm good, okay. Um, at the same time as all of this is going on, Hurston is also being trained as an anthropologist at Columbia, right? One of the first, um, if not the first, African-American uh, trained anthropologist. And in that role, she's part of a group who were defining the discipline, right? And eager to use the study of different cultures to talk about their specificities and wonders, right? rather than putting them in a hierarchy with white Europe at the top and with black Africa at the bottom. Hurston's dedication to black folk and folklore and her immersion in folklore made her an ideal candidate for this work, right? For collecting folklore and for describing how African-American vernacular speech works via rich metaphor and irony. So let's take this next slide. Okay, so this is where she's describing um, her, her work um, as an anthropologist. I was glad when somebody told me, you may go and collect Negro folklore. In a way, it would not be a new experience for me. When I pitched head foremost into the world, I landed in the crib of Negroism. From the earliest rocking of my cradle, I had known about the capers of Br'er Rabbit. I know, I'd known that the capers of Br'er Rabbit are apt to cut and what Squinch Owl says from the housetop. But it was fitting like a tight chemise. I couldn't see it for wearing it. 
It was only when I was off in college, away from my native surroundings, that I could see myself like somebody else and stand off and look at my garment. And then, then I had to have this spyglass of anthropology to look through at that. So she describes like being extremely close to the culture, but then learning in some ways, how to, learning a certain kind of objectivity right, um, in relationship to black, um, to black uh, culture and folklore. Hurston traveled all over the South collecting folklore and writing about it, and she also traveled to New, or New Orleans, uh, the Bahamas, Haiti, and Honduras. She wanted to study for a PhD, but was not able to afford it on her own. And throughout the 1920s, um, in particular after Barnard, uh, Hurston was able to be a full-time writer and scholar only because, like Langston Hughes, she had a wealthy white patron, a woman named Charlotte Osgood Mason, who was the widow of a railroad baron who was interested in primitive cultures. Mason paid Hurston a generous stipend and gave her, this is, and gave her money for a car, that's her car, um, and also money for a gun, which Hurston needed when she was traveling through the South alone. Mm -hmm. In exchange for this support, Mason owned everything that Hurston collected during that time. They had a contract. Hurston needed permission to publish until the early 1930s when the Depression set in and the money, uh, Osgood Osgood's Mason's money, dried up. Mm -hmm. Hurston published her most well-known work, including Their Eyes Are Watching God, after the contract was over and she was free. So she published much, if you look at her publication record, she published much more in the 1930s and afterwards because of this. She had a very complicated relationship with white power and money, um, so much so that she also theorized this, right, um, uh, in terms of trying to explain how she and other black people like Langston Hughes um, negotiated this. So this is the last thing. Okay, this is what she says. She talks about this um, idea called feather bed resistance. She says, the Negro, in spite of his open-faced laughter, his seeming acquiescence, is particularly evasive. You see, we are polite people and do not say to our questioner, get out of here. We smile and tell him or her something that satisfies the white person because knowing so little about us, he doesn't know what he is missing. The Indian resists by a stony silence. The Negro <laughs> offers a featherbed resistance. That is, we let the probe enter, but it never comes out. It gets smothered under a lot of laughter and pleasantries. The theory behind our tactics? The white man is always trying to know someone else's business. All right, I'll set something outside the door of my mind for him to play with and handle. He can read my writing, but he sure can't read my mind. I'll put a play toy in his hand and he will seize it and go away. Then I'll say my say and sing my song. So for her, this resistance took the form, right, of taking money and waiting of giving enough of herself, but not everything. Sometimes telling people what they wanted to hear or what would be best for them to hear, this enabled her to be one of the very first African-American women writers who wrote full time and supported herself by her writing. So today we've read How It Feels to Be Colored Me, which I've um, quoted a little bit from, and, um, and The Back Room. And I have some questions about how much time do we have? I'm running out of time. I have 13 minutes for the whole thing, or I have 13? Oh, that's great. Okay. So, so I have some questions. Um, I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions, but I also have some questions specifically about the pieces that, um, that you may have read. So I'll just, I'll just give those questions now, and then we can just have a conversation. Um, so for how it, feels to be, how it Feels to Be Colored Me, what do we learn about Hurston and your conceptions of race and gender in the essay? Right? There's some really important passages in that essay, some of which I read out loud, the one about Eatonville, right? um, the, the being a black rock surged upon. Right? This also, one of, the, one of the quotations mentioned this idea of where she calls herself cosmic Zora. Right? She says also a little bit later in that essay that the cosmic Zora is actually um, the Zora that's most connected to the feminine which is fascinating um, to me. And she also has that really important image at the end of the essay, which is where she talks about herself and all people, right, as a bag of miscellany. Right? So I'm interested in that. For the back room, this story, as I said before, is really unusual in, in, Hurston's, uh, in Hurston's work, right? And, it's, and in that it's one of these sort of very recently discovered stories where Hurston writes about elite African-American um, intelligentsia and culture in Harlem 
during the 1920s, right? We really think of her as a Southern writer, but in fact, she was as interested, or at least sometimes interested, right, in, um, in what was happening in Harlem during the time that she was here sure. during the Renaissance as well. Right? Um, for those of you, I don't know if there are any English majors in the room, I hope so, but um, for those of you who might have been English majors when you were here, you will notice that this story in particular has a really interesting echo with Oscar Wilde's famous story, The Picture of Dorian Gray, right? In which there is a painting, right? Um, in The Picture of Dorian Gray, there, the, Dorian Gray has a painting that, what is it? I'm gonna forget now. The painting ages and he does not, right? Um, so that there's a way in which there's some kind of deal with the devil, right, that he's made, that this painting will just sort of deteriorate as he maintains this sort of health, and um, not health, I mean uh, youth, Right? which is really connected to actually a sort of a kind of moral degradation. Right? Mm -hmm. In Hurston's story, the painting of, um, of Lilia, the painting doesn't, doesn't do any of that work, right? but what the painting does is it provides for her this really interesting um, way in which she contemplates right? her own mortality, mm -hmm. right? her own sort of aging process, and really looks at it looks at that looks at the painting of her when she was slightly younger right as this sort of um, uh, talisman but also as in some ways um, related to the way in which she misses in some ways opportunities by paying too much attention to this non mirror image right in some way of herself right as she's getting as she's old, as she's aging Right? It really becomes a way in which we as readers, I think, contemplate her pride, right? And the way in which her pride and propriety really destroy her chances um, at love in that story, right? So this story is really interesting to me because it's, um, it asks the question of what possibilities are there for a woman of age, right, in 1920s Harlem, which was a place of jazz, of youth, and of beauty. Right? So Hurston's really interested, if we can think about her again as being, you know, in her mid-30s, right, while um, here on Barnard's campus, right, and also, I mean, many, many of her peers in the Harlem Renaissance also had no idea that she was, she was much older than they anticipated, right? So that story has this really kind of interesting and poignant um, reflection, right, of what does it mean, right, to be, to be aging, right, um, in, this, in this sort of environment that is really valuing Right? Youth, avant-gardeness, um, newness. Right? Um, so there's a real contemplation there um, um, about, about that. So I am done talking, and I'm very happy to hear your reflections right? or to answer any questions you might have or comments. Question. Question, yes. Yeah, so how old was um, she when she wrote The Bachelor? She, it was, that was written in 1927, so that would have meant she was like 38. Thank you. Yeah. Her real age? Yes. Her real age, 38. <laughs> yeah, the rest of her life, I mean, the 1930s were a good, were, was a good decade for her, um, because that's when she starts to publish, um, uh, she starts to publish some of her novels. Um, that were actually very popular. So, and in particular, um, in 1937, when she published *Their Eyes Were Watching God*, which was, which was, you know, at the time, sold well and gave her a lot of um, recognition. Also, something that we don't, I don't think we pay enough attention to now is that um, you'll see this. This quotation is from *Mules and Men*, which was a, one of the volumes of her um, folklore. So the thing is, she was also publishing folklore um, later. Um, throughout the 1930s, and those books were also really popular. Right? Like, I don't think we read folklore in the way, <laughs> now, in the way that people did then, right? So she was, she was really, um, you know, she was really a kind of very strong and well-known voice for thinking about African-American culture, right? And for, in some ways, preserving, um, in particular, it's um, the folkloric stories, um, the vernacular language, the metaphoric uh, richness and dynamism of African-American um, speech in particular, speech and sort of performance culture. So the 30s was a good, was a good moment. Um, the, after the 30s, things, things become very different for her. Um, she has a really very difficult time supporting herself by writing, 
Um, the 19, through the, through the depression, she had gotten by, by working for the Works Progress um, Association, right, and um, for teaching for a couple of um, southern colleges. Uh, the 40s was a much more difficult time, and there were also some controversies um, in her life that made it very difficult for her to stay in Harlem, right? So she, um, she was accused falsely, like patently falsely accused of, of, of molesting a, a young boy, um, she was out of the country at the time, and so she eventually produced her passport to prove that it was not possible. But that that incident and the ways in which some of the black um, black community responded to it was very very difficult for her. Um, so she she left New York and relocated um, down south. And it's after that moment then things become really difficult for her. Um, she has has difficulty maintaining. Um, maintaining a job, but also because she had done a bunch of, in the 30s, she had done a lot of traveling, like I said, I mentioned Haiti, Honduras, um, a whole bunch of other places, and developed while she was down there some kind of an intestinal um, mm. problem. It's unclear, it's even unclear now what it was, but it plagued her for the rest of her life. So her health deteriorated um, throughout the 50s um, and the 60s were really difficult. Um, the only thing I can say about the very end of her life is that she, she did, go back to, um, not to Eatonville, but to a community, to Fort Pierce, Florida, a community that's a little bit north of Eatonville, and, um, you know, was a sort of regular part of that community, um, a regular sort of cherished and loved part of that community towards the end of her life. Um, so that, that was one, um, that was the one sort of thing that, um, that made it, that made the ending of her life not, um, didn't reflect all of the turbulence that happened before. But she was, um, You'll also know this, uh, that she was so impoverished at the time that when she was buried that her, that she could not afford, and the people who raised money to, um, for her funeral service could not afford a marker on her grave. So very famously, Alice Walker, the um, African-American writer Alice Walker, um, when she rediscovered Hurston's writings in the late 60s and early 70s, um, decided to find Hurston's grave. So went down to Florida and found the spot where, um, where Hurston was buried and erected that uh, gravestone that I showed at the very uh, beginning of this presentation. Wow. So, and it was after that point that Hurston's work, which was all out of print, uh, started coming back into, um, at, into print and um, back into classrooms. Yeah. Who has the biggest selection of your papers for the archive? What we all are they? They're kind of spread out. So um, that was one of the unfortunate things about the end, the very ending of her life, and the poverty that she was in. She also had. There was also um, there was a fire. There was a fire at the very uh, end of her life, and a lot of the um, a lot of her uh, manuscripts were burnt, um, but they re rescued some of them. Um, so. They exist at the University of Florida. Uh, the Schomburg Library has some things, and the Library of Congress. The Library of Congress, very interestingly, has a lot of digitized um, information there. So you can see and you can hear Hurston singing some um, folk songs on that uh, on their website, which is really amazing, right? And they also have some of her um, anthropological films, which are some of the only films we have of these sort of. Uh, kind of African-American rituals that really come out of um, uh, the time of enslavement, that um, ring dances and such things, right, that, that had never been seen before by um, people who did not live in those communities. So, yeah. We have very little here at Barnard. So, mm -hmm. and over here. Yeah, it's a great right, right, piece. Yeah. Yeah. But I think he characterized her in the 20s in Harlem. You know, I'm sure it was very, very much a generation. Mm -hmm. So the event that is said to have been in one part. Yes. But of course, there are many generations of people there. And I'm sure she didn't feel that out of place there. Oh, she didn't feel out of place, but she was just really concerned that the older generation of um, of folks, of folks with power, right, in Harlem and those people who were working within the Harlem Renaissance, she was concerned that they were thinking about black identity and black representation in a very narrow way, right? So, I mean, there were older people who also believed, as she did, right, that, that you know, as Langston Hughes says um, in um, 
in the Racial Mountain essay that you know, the most important thing for black people to do at that time is just to express themselves however they are, right? It's not about necessarily appealing to a white philanthropic audience, right? As much as it is finding ways to express, yes. right? Um, uh, black identity and black culture in, in more or less a kind of unapologetic way. I don't really need a mic, but I'll use it. Um, my name is Shannon Harris, I'm BCO1. Um, I've, I've made two short films, one of which references their eyes were watching God. Mm -hmm. um, I'd love to share it with you too, in case you'd like to sure. include it in your conversation um, and uh, planning around the mm -hmm. centennial. Um, they were also reviewed by Marilyn Jimenez, who was another Barnard um, mm -hmm. uh, alum and screened for the Barnard Club of New York. Um, so my question, how was, um, how were the stories in hitting a straight lick with a crooked stick um, discovered? Discovered, yeah, how were they found? That's a great question. Um, you know, since the, I wouldn't say the 80s, right, um, there's been a, just a tremendous amount of archival work done by um, scholars of African American literature and culture, um, where people have just simply gone back <laughs> into for example, this, that particular story, The Back Room, was published in, um, in a literary magazine or a newspaper, actually, I think it was a newspaper, um, that, that, had a, that had a black audience. So people just went, just simply kind of went back to all of those sources and um, digitization made it much easier for you, to, for you to search for, you know, Hurston or Hughes. Um, really went back and just read everything again, right, and found all kinds of things that um, that had never that people didn't know about, right? Um, very few people were collecting the short stories that 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 appeared in newspapers, right? The ones who were in literary magazines, even the smaller literary magazines, those were more well known. But um, but it it just came down to sort of doing that really uh, painstaking work in front of a microfilm machine. Um, over an, any number of years before people were like, okay, so now we can, you know, we found two or three stories here, we found three or four here, you know, now let's try to sort of get them together. And this particular book, which is um, uh, edited by Genevieve West, uh, Genevieve had been in contact with Henry Louis Gates Jr., who was one of the people who started, um, who started the sort of archival work in the early, um, in the late 80s. And they just kind of pieced together where all of these things were and contacted other people who had found other things and figured, you know, at a certain point, not only did they have a volume, but they had a volume that was telling a really different story about Hurston's career. So, um, yeah, 2020. So when I, whenever I teach classes on Hurston, I mean, I almost always save the last week, right, because there's some other thing that has come up, <laughs> right? Um, <laughs> And that we can talk about. So, um, so yeah, it's a it's a continu continuous process. You know, even a couple of years ago, there was another um, colleague at Columbia found found a whole novel that was yeah um, that was um, by um, uh, why am I not remembering his name? All right, I'm not going to remember. Sorry, it's late. Um, a whole novel that nobody knew about. I mean, just sitting there in the um, in the rare books manuscripts. Wow. So, there's still a lot out there, I'm sure of it. Are we done? Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> yeah, let's just let's try. Let's, why don't you come up? Okay. So now we've saved some time because we would really Jennifer and I have had this sort of incredible year, right? Of talking with um, students, staff. Um, alum and other faculty members about the kinds of things that we might want to do that are both in relationship to the Hurston Centennial specifically. So a celebration of her matriculation and graduation between 2025 and the 100, 2025 and 2028. But we're also interested in thinking about ways to, um, to, really, to really do much more intentional work. We're thinking about the 100 years of black students at Barnard, right? So those things are related, but they're not exactly the same. So, um, so we're interested in hearing from 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 you all, from alums, what kinds of things um, do you think might be useful, interesting, necessary, overdue, um, future oriented? And so, 
we're really, really happy to um, take ideas because um, we still have some time. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. Um, since graduating, a group of us who were very active in what is now Ball mm -hmm. um, have always constantly donated in, from the annual fund perspective as a write-in gift for the refurbishment and maintenance of the Zorn and Hoof Mound. Yeah. And it's been interesting that at no point did it become a standard checkbox mm -hmm. that could be affected yes. and then changed to see yes. over the last several decades now. Mm -hmm. um, so that's something I, I'm curious as when on ABC for years mm -hmm. um, when I was part of that, I would love to see from a development perspective that to be a trackable line, not just a write-in. Thank you. Yeah. What do you want to know? I mean, this is the thing when I think about this, I keep thinking, what what do I want to know about um, about Hurston, about her time here, or about the the history of Black students um, at Barnard? Timeline. Okay, timeline. Good. As a parent of a forty two year old who just went back uh, in his sophomore year, not at Barnard, obviously. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm curious as to how somebody who presented as a 26-year-old was admitted and what she had gathered at uh, the other academy, mm -hmm. I mean, was she considered a transfer or, or a first yes. year? Yes. yes, she was a transfer. <laughs> and um, on, the, on the BCRW website, um, the first issue of the Scholar and Feminist that I edited on, um, on Zora Neale Hurston includes, there's a, it's kind of toward the bottom, but there's a link there. Um, where you can see what documents we have from the archives, which would include the, her transcript. I mean, so watch out, your transcript could end up, you know, <laughs> your famous could end up on the Barnard website. The transcript and um, a transcript, a letter from Virginia Gildersleeve, right, who was, we're talking to another um, uh, seven sibling uh, college about, about whether or not they allow uh, black students to live on campus, so a conversation about that, um, and some other related information. So that's all on the on the website that you can that you can look up. What are the items on the candidates' Yes and no. <laughs> um, Jennifer, do you want to? Yeah, we figured, we figured out her number two was. Yeah. That was our first question. Was, yeah. yeah. And, but then number three, we don't know, right? No. Yeah. So, um, so that's, that's one of the projects that we are absolutely thinking of doing. There have been a number of students in the past, I'm going to say 10 years or so, mm -hmm. who have done, um, who have done project, who have, who have done projects where they've, where they've attempted, right, to, um, to learn much more about, um, about black students, but for a, for a little bit of time, I mean, there's one. What's it? What's Clint's project called? Oh yeah, in the, we can. Where is that? It's on. It, right? It's on the archives website, I think. Yeah. Um, it's called black. I think it's called Black at Barnard. Um, okay. and, and recent student tried to figure out by G, because they we, they weren't tracking race necessarily in, in admissions in the same way that we now do, so tried to figure out using zip codes, right? Um, and neighborhood data, whether or not that person um, perhaps was was black or of color, right? But, the, but this, it's a messy, it's a very messy um, business, right? So, um, so there have been there have been some attempts recently by students to do projects related to that. But we want to make sure that we actually embark on that project, right, as an institution, mm -hmm. and therefore, you know, rather than it be a senior thesis for one student in the history department, it can be a project that we take on. As an institution. And you can look up, you can go into the Barnard website and look up Corinth Jackson, Black at Barnard, and you'll find it'll, come, and up. it'll come up. Her project will come up. Thank you. Sorry. No, very loud. Um, I'm class of 88, but I'm speaking for my daughter who's class of 2016, Nia Ashley, oh, who hi. is. <laughs> <laughs> hi. hi, Nia's mother. So my daughter <laughs> Nia is uh, one of the students from Barnard who's going to be working on the Black at Barnard project. And one of the things that 
our family is very interested in is the oral history of women, which people don't always take the time to write down the stories of what it was really like to be black, to be female, to be in academia, all of those things that um, we've shared with one another over the centuries from my great grandmother who um, passed away at 102 and told us a series of oral stories. So I'm pitching now for anyone who knows anyone who was black at Barnard uh, to reach out to Nia so that she can gather more of the stories of what it was like. Um, there's four stories here of all of us who are here from 88, but I think everybody's individual story is so important. So I thank you for um, supporting Nia and trying to uh, gather these stories. And I'm encouraging, if you know anybody, because we don't, one of the things she's found out is that it's hard to find everyone, right? So if you know anyone, just let them know that it's happening. And if they want to tell their story, they can reach out. And the archives will be keeping that. Yes. So it will be held at Barnard. Yeah. And we, we anticipate not just Nia's project, but many other, we're hoping to get a bunch of students involved in taking, in taking these oral histories because we really want to make sure that those experiences are preserved and that we can, that we can all learn from them. Francis. <laughs> This is not on the being, committee too. Yeah. <laughs> not being a, um, an English major and being a anthropology wannabe, although my mother said that they didn't give black women, ne I should never expect them to give black women money to go dig in the ground because she didn't know the difference between anthropology and archeology. span <laughs> um, And it, it would have been impertinent for me to tell her. So I would be very much interested in much more about her anthropo anthropological yeah. work. She'd be a real anthropologist, not Absolutely. a fake anthropologist. She developed some of the, the techniques I mean, of participant observation that anthropology right now is based upon. So yes, yeah. Yep, that's, that's one of the reasons why we're partnering with um, uh, Columbia. We don't, we don't have a, an anthropologist here at Barnard who, who is very familiar with, I mean, who's, for whom Hurston is a major figure, but Vanessa Agar Jones over at Columbia, um, her, she teaches a class on, on Hurston called Zora um, that, um, that is very much about that. So we're partnering with, um, with her. Okay, I was gonna ask, isn't there a Zora Neale Hurston scholarship or, I thought there, I thought I contributed to it. Uh, student yeah. scholarship. I thought okay. I contributed to it. We also need to amplify that, right? Well, I would, yeah. Yes. I, I just wanted to know if, uh, in dispersing that, if there would be a special effort made to, to identify young women who are extremely talented, maybe from a working class background or with what we might call a strong personality <laughs> to reflect the person in whose honor it was made, the people from the black community who are, who might really have some trouble getting into a prestigious school for whatever reason, because of their background or because of their personality, right? I just tossing that out there. <laughs> <laughs> It goes to an admitted student. Thank you very much. Hold. We just have to move to the next thing. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.